right back from the break and uh an interesting error so i i just went to the app uh, over here <laughs> and we're getting uh oh you can't see the the toast it's right it's below the the video right here um but bad gateway error well, that means the service is down why is the service down well looking at the log uh it doesn't like the twitch user id because it's like that's a number why are you trying to put it into a string uh and that Here's a question. Is that, is that, should it be a number or should it be a string? Uh, let's see. Twitch API. So when we authenticate, I'm trying to get a sense of like, get back. How do we get? How do we get an ID? There's a reference. Excellent. I mean, if Twitch's API says it's a number, if it just says it's a something, you know, then let's say, what if we try to get users? ID of the user to get. So their examples do look very number-like. Do they say, say, they say the type is string. Not an integer. Um, now they they are number like. They are they are a sequence of digits apparently right now. Um, in API design, one thing I might have done if I was designing this API is obfuscate, obfuscate. Um, make non-obvious the content of the value uh, to dissuade people from thinking, oh, it looks like a number. I will store it in, in you know, 32-bit, uh, 64-bit, um, you know, some, some numerical format, right? Um, but that being said, uh, I imagine at some point, which might have to weigh uh, a decision of like changing the ID from something that's numeric. And <laughs> how is that gonna break things? Um, both internally and externally. But for now, uh, I think it's good being a string. So the question is, how do we make figment accept that the environment variables contents looks like a number, but it needs to be stored in a string? Uh, and that is a question that I don't know the answer to, but maybe the docs will tell us. Uh, let's see. Yes. Joining util. Okay. Map macro. Just because the value is currently comp see that that's an interesting behavior in and of itself, right? The idea that the contents of the environment variable and the the because that that's effectively runtime. It may be like okay, at the time the service starts, right? When the environment variables are set, but because that value can vary. The behavior of how it's going to treat the type of the data uh, 
berries. Um, it's not great. So, useful functions and macros for writing figments. I see a map macro, uh, back tuple map, pool from str or int, diff paths. Uh, okay, nest. So I don't see anything to be like, this should be a string. So. Okay, tell me about env. I provided the source of its values from environment variables. That's what we're, we're doing. All key lookups and comparisons are case insensitive. Uh, environment val variable values can contain structured data. Uh, and it's talking about the structured data. Um, it's cool. I don't care about structured data. I care about <laughs> like if it's, so here's the thing, right? num u size any unsigned integer why does it think it's an unsigned integer well because it's just composed out of uh digits anything else string delimited by quote so if we have literal quotes inside of the environment variable that would persuade it to treat it like a string so is there a way to communicate to this to change its behavior. Like, I would have thought that saying that this is a string would do that. But apparently it wants to force it the other way. Source for configuration value, okay. Recent changes. Three months ago. So, what version am I on? Let's check that really quick. Uh, let's see. Cargo. Dot. Amol. Uh, 0.10.19. So, that's the latest release version according to this. So the
that is awesome. Very Straightforward is lost in that drum. No, that's, that's the opposite of what I want. Huh. Um. Materialize the deflected value into T. Okay, so we have extract, which is what we're using right now. We have extract lossy. Different numbers and booleans more flexibly. Okay, so an example of that, they have file numbers and then they're quoted. This is doing the exact opposite of what I want to do. Um, if I have a thing, an environment variable, a big name was just one. Why would you choose to interpret it as a number? That is a choice, but it is one that I apparently I do not have any control over. Uh, I'm just checking to see if there's something I'm missing here. The the other thing I can do is I can just change the environment variables to be quoted, and uh, that at least will make it work. I just don't want to do that because I would like for this to just be like a drop-in change. You know, nice when you can do that, but uh, I'm gonna say that that doesn't seem to be on the table. So instead, we go to docker-compose.yaml and ah. So I think I can. Hmm. So. Will the quotes make it into the actual environment variable? I don't know. Or do I have to escape the quotes here? I'm not using quotes anywhere else, although this is this is a YAML file. Uh, so I think the, the quotes are kind of in, implied. So this might do nothing. Um, but this was the thing that was having problems, right? The Twitch user ID is being interpreted as a number. It should be pretty fast because I'm not changing anything since the last build. Started. Can you, can you start. Let's see what happens. Restarting, it says. But no output. I'm thinking. Oh, I tried to click the, the three dots, and instead it just ignored and opened it. I guess because they're disabled, so it clicks through. Hmm. Okay, so what's going on here? I started a minute ago. Ah, here we go. Okay, so it's still a number. Okay, so it did eat the quotes. That makes sense. Uh, let's see. Can I, how do you, how do you, can I do that? 
but then will it read the <laughs> will that work Thing I should probably do in a in a YAML file like this uh, is really just quote everything and not rely on the YAML parser to do it for me uh, because there's a risk that uh, things could be eaten. Um, not in any of these particular examples, but there's definitely cases where. You want to like, say you, um, you want to say, oh, there's this new model and it's called 007. <laughs> well, this is not going to make it to the application as 007, as it turns out. Uh, because those, those leading zeros of what is apparently a numeric value will get stripped. So. This is a thing I should be doing, uh, but how is this going? Okay, so fail to load config. Can I make this bigger? Yes. Uh, fail to load config error. Tag default profile. Default profile. Missing field. Open AI key. Uh, on line 33 of uh, main the RS, right? Yeah. So where we uh, main.rs? Yeah. Where we actually, you know, call load config here. That's where we're panicking. And we want that to be a panic. I think that's fine. Um, so failing to find opening IP so what should be happening is it should see opening IP path right here and read from it and put that into opening IP key so why didn't it why doesn't it File provider wrap, build from a figment provider, no different environment variables. Okay. So we have file adapter equals file adapter wrap, PNB prefix. I don't, I'm not doing prefix. I'm just doing raw instead. And another example, figment new. Merge. It looks for uh, app bar file because in their example config they have bar. They are prefixing the environment variable so that strips off that. And then the underscore file at the end is the part that tells the file adapter that it's a file. So bar value should end up in config.bar. Is join causing problems? So I'm gonna do. 
Uh, I am going to... Yeah, we have this back end. Do this. Alliance. And just get rid of defaults. Uh, and I'm just going to get rid of this. I'm just going to make this a little simpler in hopes that I'll make everything good. Um. At least the error that we we're getting before about switch user ID went away. So there's that, right? Uh, all right, so I'm gonna do it Docker and close up. I'm gonna rebuild app. Let's see how that goes. So, uh, yeah, so I did get the pull request updated. This is gonna fix both 156, which is our uh, check checkout fig. Oh yeah, check checkout figment uh, task, and then also 108 make HTTP client uh, user agent be configurable. Uh, or and or use program version while we're doing one part of it. That's, that's fine. All right, so we are. API is recreated, so if I go back to Docker Desktop, API. Okay, so missing field, open AI key. Uh, from right now, okay. Well, that is unfortunate. Why? Why, why is it missing? Shouldn't be missing. Oh, opening I key. Where we don't have a prefix for the environment variable, so it's not looking for not anything like that. And we are passing opening I key path. And path is the default suffix for file adapter wrap underscore file. Huh. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess I'll go look at the other docs. Go it this link. Then uh, Figment File Provider Adapter. Here's this crate from 10 months ago. Uh, version 0.1.1. Uh, so merge file adapter wrap environment dot extract. This crate contains the file adapter provider for Figment to allow loading configuration values from either direct values or files. It wraps around an existing provider. For every key that ends in file, it replaces the value with reading the file mentioned. Yeah. I mean, this looks very much like what we're doing, right? Now, now that I took off the, uh, the other bits, Right, figment new merge file adapter wrap. Figment new merge file adapter wrap. Extract. Okay, let's check out the repo. Uh, 10 months ago, that release. Okay, so there hasn't been any work since then. Uh, one closed issue. Okay. One closed pull request. Okay. Hmm. What am I doing wrong then? Yeah, it's 
pass an API key to the configuration you use either the config value API key, or you could write the API key to a file and pass the config value API key file to the path. So that's, that's what I'm doing. So why is this gone wrong? Open a AI key path, yeah? Open a AI key. Is it, is it because it is not a string? A secret? is uh, <laughs> uh, an error on my part. There we go. Okay. That's the right thing. So um, I probably also need to... Okay. Nothing. No secrets in task worker. Because the task worker just calls back to the API. So it just needs to know uh, how to talk to Redis. Uh, and at least so far, it's a local Redis instance. There's no authentication. Uh, all right, so, whoops, that was all my fault. <laughs> mm. All right, good. So we can move on to uh, other things soon. Oh, that's good. So, uh, while that's happening, uh, I think the next thing is going to be looking at refactoring and extracting common OAuth code. So, um, right now I have custom OAuth implementations for talking to uh, Google's YouTube APIs and the Twitch. And I think we should be able to use like this open uh, this. OAuth 2 RS great to uh, do stuff. And I'd love to know about doing a proper challenge where you pass a value with it. I think the idea here is that when we're doing OAuth and we send um, the request to the, uh, the API for the OAuth flow, we pass a, a value that we expect to get back. I don't actually know if I care about doing that uh, right now, but uh, let's... Okay, it started. It's running. It's doing stuff. Uh, do we have an application again? We do. I can look at records. Maybe. Um, or is this... Right, I still have this popped out. There we go. Do we not implement uh, things there? Let's go to streams. We can view a stream, right? Here's our test stream from uh, a couple weeks ago. Look at episodes. Um, something that we have we have a provided an out of range value for the select stream ID component that's interesting what's there now okay cool so the application is back it works uh, and what have I changed oh I did change the docker compose right we uh, added HTTP client agent um, 
I got rid of the default stuff completely, and we're just passing the agent uh, value. Uh, I quoted some things. Uh, I guess technically speaking, like, to be really thorough, I would just quote that again. Whatever. It, it works now. I'm going to commit it as is. And uh, we're going to move on. Uh, hmm. Environment variable names. And there and there. Yes. Good enough. All right. Back to here. I will set this to auto merge. Very soon that will be merged into main and we will be done with uh, these two tasks. So I guess next up, OAuth code. Sounds very, <laughs> uh, well, not exciting, but it will be good to, you know, do a little bit of, a little bit of cleanup. Uh, some improvements. So where are we at right now with the OAuth code? Well, uh, where does that live? So we have some in twitch.rs here and we have some in youtube.rs. Um, let's ooh, let me look at the outliner. And just bold everything. There we go. So we have several things related to OAuth flow here. Where we, uh, let's see, do we? Uh, well, we have like get token. Yeah. It's the access token and refresh token from the YouTube API. We have get refresh token. We have uh, let's see, get login handler. So this builds out the URL that we need to go to with the scopes and everything. Post login handler is the endpoint that accepts the, oh, we should really do better than just say it's a sorry JSON value. <laughs> uh, okay, so there's a, there's a code in the body, right? And the code then is what we use. We call get token with it. We get the access and refresh token. We uh, grab our connection to Redis. Uh, we store the refresh token. We store the access token and we say, okay, we're done. Uh, so these things, right? And then there's something very similar over in Twitch where we have get token, do refresh token, update refresh token, get login handler, post login handler. Um, yeah, so that that all handles OAuth. Ooh, here we are merged now. Um, so that all handles kind of the OAuth flow for both Twitch and YouTube to be able to call into those APIs. Um, the Twitch one I'm using currently mainly to uh, do the Twitch import of stream data. I do eventually want to have something that will allow me to uh, have stream uh, data in the app and push it to Twitch, specifically uh, a thing that is, it's a trivial thing. It's a thing that only takes a few minutes of time to do each time, but it's like, what are the tags I always use for this stream, right? Go and do that it'd be really cool if i just had a thing where i could go and click a button and it would update the stream title it would update the stream tags uh so that's something i want to do i think it's in the list of things um Uh, okay, that, that's about pulling tags from the stream. Uh, let's see, add ability to live update the countdown. Okay, now that integrate with the 
FPS, agent swarming, multi-channel bot, um, UI stuff, task record cleanup. Lots of things I want to do. <laughs> uh, not cool. Uh, Make it easier to upload multiple YouTube to multiple YouTube accounts. That is a thing eventually I'm going to do, probably. To have like all the VODs go to my Saban VODs channel, and then have more uh edited content go to separate channels. Uh do I not have a thing about um So here's a YouTube video scheduling, right? So setting what time videos go live on YouTube, which would be nice, especially if I have, um, if I get back to having all the different series bonds going up onto YouTube and then more edited content, that'd be good to, to manage. Um, I don't have, okay, well, let's add a thing then. So um, what do I want? When do I want it? So I think the idea would be from a series. So like I would go into glowing telegram project, chill Sunday morning coding, and I could have a button here that would be like, um, sync to Twitch. That would take the title. Um, this title yeah that title and um, I would need to have tags which I can add tags here um, does this actually work or is this UI that doesn't actually have <laughs> anything backing it let's find out so a tag that I always use here is uh, Rustline so if I save that, does that actually get saved? Yeah, okay. Uh, TypeScript. So that's good. Uh, so the idea would be that I would click a button and it would take the stream, the title, the title, and the tags, and it would update the the stream. Like, uh, yeah, something like that. So that would be nice to be able to do. So let's add a add button in a series um, edit view uh, series record to be more specific edit view to sync info into uh, twitch stream uh, manager That is a feature that I would like sooner rather than later. The sooner I have it, the more time it will save me, hopefully. The more annoyance, honestly. It's not really about time. It's about, you know, it's just an impediment. Um, video title and description template on series. That would be good too. So we'll, we'll have some series related things. Uh, okay, so back to this, OAuth to RS. So here, here we have an example where it's authing to, uh, to GitHub. They don't have an example for say Twitch, but if we look at Google, this, uh, let's blow this up a little bit. There we go. Um, and hide the sidebar. So this is, let me also go find the uh, link to the crate. They're on or 4.2, it's also a 5.0 alpha version. Okay, this example showcases the Google OAuth 2 process for requesting access to well, Google Calendar features in this case and the user profile. What I would be doing would be slightly different. Um, and they like are reading environment variables, so we would be passing this in to our code. So they have OAuth 2 request, OAuth 2 basic client, standard revocable token, token response, 
auth URL, authorization code, client ID, client secret, CSRF token, KCE code challenge, redirect URL, revocation URL, scope and token URL. Um, so Google client ID is a client ID coming from here. Uh, client secret is uh, also from OAuth2, client secret. And then auth URL, token URL. So I think I have all of these things. I think it'd be interesting if in the um, config struct I just built, if we can actually have the config values use these, what I assume are structs um, there and have this like auto load. I don't know. Okay, and then they make a basic client with client ID, client secret, auth and token URLs. Are these URLs similar to what I'm using? Is a question. Like, is this is this pretty close? We have an error. Uh, oh, it's out of date. Oh, go ahead and restart. Or reload workspace would have also worked. Um, so things I won't want to want to do on stream are open.env files. I will look at Docker Compose though. YouTube client ID. Ah. Okay. Well, uh, I don't think I can look at that on stream because I think there are secrets in that env file. So um, let's just assume for now that these these are similar to what we're doing today. Okay, see, set redirect URI. So this is telling it how to get back to the uh, server. And Google supports OAuth2 token revocation, which is interesting. Um, so, like if we're looking at the YouTube code that I have today, how does this work? All right, so in Git Login Handler, we were passing in these things. So redirect URL, client ID, um, and then we're telling it about the response type we want. Access type is offline, include granted scopes and these scopes. So do we have something similar here? Um, HTTP client is doing request blocking client builder. Following redirects opens the client up to SSRF vulnerabilities. Okay, what are we using the HTTP client for here? I just want to double click that. Did that not? So th is this? supports proof key for code exchange. So we create this, this code verifier and encode it as a code challenge. We generate the authorization URL, which will redirect the user. Okay. So client is our uh, basic client from OAuth2. And we create an authorized URL with a new CSRF token. And then we add the scopes that we want. These will be different for this application versus this here. We set PKCE challenge to be that, whatever that is, a thing that we have a verifier for. Uh, and then we get an authorized URL. So this this part, like everything up to here, corresponds to what's in uh, Git Login Handler. Um, I think what could potentially be interesting is. I guess there's really only one place that needs all of this, so I don't know that it would make sense to like bring this client into the app state struct. We just we can create this. Like, we can basically do all of this inside of that 
one method. Uh, down to here. And then, uh, okay, so then we implement a server to handle the redirect. So this part is the part that would likely happen inside of this uh, handler. So what does it get back? Um, so it reads things. Uh, it's a very simple HTTP server, essentially. Um, it's an idea, Uncle Ben. Oh, URL parse. Redirect URL. What's going on here? Redirect URL is request lines, but why space? Okay. So it's 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 parsing the HTTP request coming in to the server. It's getting the path, and then it's constructing a URL by appending the path to localhost, okay? And it needs to do that so it can use uh, this URL uh, functionality to get query pairs and stuff. It needs to be a full URL and not just the path. It's looking for the code, right? So this part is all, you know, implemented by Axum and all of our HTTP stuff that we already have, and it gets us a code. Uh, and then there's also a state. Um, which we wrap into a CSRF token. So state is the value that we passed in to uh, when we used authorized URL, that CSRF token uh, new random. We got back a CSRF state, and presumably we're gonna use that to validate the state. Okay, and then it returns a response back to the request that let Google know that that worked. And then we have the code and the state and what we expected it to be. Uh, and this is where we would actually check that's valid before uh, proceeding. And then token response client.exchange code set PKCE verifier request. Okay. So this is where we're calling back to the server. So um, stuff that we're doing in get token, right? Where we take the code and we, in this version, yeah, yeah. So this stuff can basically, I think that this function can just go away completely. Uh, and so we get token response. We unwrap that and that gets us a token to revoke refresh token. Oh, and this is attempting to revoke the token. Okay. I don't care about that. Uh, we can, we can uh, essentially token response here should be the thing that has the refresh token and the access token in it. Yeah. Okay. So this should save us a few lines of code. And, you know, not having to re-implement OAuth 2 uh, by hand. So I think uh, this is what I want to do. So we're going to grab uh, cargo add OAuth 2 and then come over here, uh, get to our terminal. I'm going to, uh, I'm, I think for now, I'm going to focus on the, um, the YouTube version uh, and working through it. And then we'll switch over to the Twitch one uh, after just do one at a time. Uh, <laughs> so, oh, and while I'm thinking about it, let me get on a branch. So we have, uh, an issue. So I can just click that and that will create a branch for me with the issue number. And we're going to CD into the API crate and run cargo add OAuth 2. What did that tell us? Uh, adding OAuth 2 to dependencies uh, and included. Hey, dang newbie. How's it going? I, know, I could probably move it. There we go. I see my hands most of the time. Uh, let's see. So, I don't know. Like these we definitely want, and presumably this worked way I would expect. Huh. 
do this. Let me uh, let me be a little bit more explicit here. And did not know about features. Now let's see. Rust plus TLS. That's the thing we want. Uh, it's a thing we include elsewhere. Um, I don't know what PKCE plane is and if we need it, so. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll leave that as is for now. Should be good. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to need is some imports. How has your Sunday been going, uh? Dang newbie. Good, I hope. Uh, I, I will start with all of these OAuth 2 uh, imports. Go from there. So, uh, I think the logical place to start here is in the git login handler, because that's where we get the, uh, the URL that we return to the front end. So the front end can send the user to Google to log in. Uh, so instead of doing all of this, we're gonna do something different. Previous implementation. Using what? <laughs> to create. Now what's fun is I can get Copilot to do stuff like this for me. Uh, if I just give it a little hint of what I'm trying to do. Uh, and this almost, it almost, uh, I can almost believe this is right. There's some things I don't like about this. Uh, the first is it's calling dot expect on things. Uh, I suspect that that's not right anyway. Does, yeah, okay. New does return a result. Can do that. Ah. Thinking about when we were working on the config uh, struct and uh, our app config, uh, app state, we have this new, and this could have been a result. And then I could have uh, constructed the config inside of this. I think this is better, uh, honestly, anyway, but yeah. Um, right, that makes sense. This is just a method. It's not, uh, a, I think I called this a constructor of one. And I guess that's not really a good, uh, parallel <laughs> there. It doesn't have to return self. Which is, of course, just an alias, I think, for representing app state. Anyway. Um, but I don't want to call expect, even though this calls, this is a result. Um, what I want to do, let me think about this. I probably, has it been another hour? Can you believe it? Okay. What I probably want to do is I, I, I'm feeling like this will this will be a lot nicer if I could uh, move this into a separate function that's going to check all of the different things uh, and return a result. And then, ooh, actually, can't no, like if I did instead of I if I didn't do dot expect right if I just did question mark here. Um, what this will do is that this will cause us to return from this function. And that's not going to type check because this function doesn't return a result. And that's why I need kind of like a, a helper function here to wrap, um, let's do function get, um, Google OAuth. 
compliance. Yeah, something like that. Um, I don't need to pass the whole state to it. I can just pass the config. That. And... It's unhappy about some things. Uh, probably because I need to wrap this whole thing in an okay. For it to be a result. Uh, and then we don't need to refer to state here, just config. So, pretty good. And then what I can do here is I want to call match, right? And so if that was all successful, we get a client. And if it's an error of any kind, we return something that becomes a HTTP response that there was an error. Um, that is progress of a sort. What's unhappy here? Oh, expected string found string reference. Can we just like dereference that then? Uh, Clippy's thinking. All right. Well, somehow it's been another hour. Uh, probably need to clone here. Uh, but I need to take a break and get some more water, stretch my legs, and I will return just in a few minutes. And we'll keep on working on uh, making this happy. All right, BRB. Let's just try this. So essentially take anything.js and replace it with uh, the anything. 